Hey everybody, it's Rob. Welcome back to the channel and another episode of A Look at the Book. This is actually going to span a few episodes because there are five books so far in this series that I've gotten my hands on and I want to talk about all of them uh, as in-depth as possible as I can. And the series that I'm talking about was written by James M. Spawn and it is The Hero's Journey. Now The Hero's Journey saw its first edition this one, uh, using the white box rules. And this edition is now sadly out of print and hard to get your hands on. I can't find a physical copy of it. I wish I could, uh, just because I'm a completist and I'd like to have it on the shelf with the other stuff. But what we're going to be focusing on in this series is the Hero's Journey 2nd Edition Fantasy Role Playing Game. What is the difference? Well, as I said, the first one focuses mainly on White Box as a rule set, but White Box did not allow James to do everything that he wanted to do with his game. So uh, after the success of the first edition, he eventually got to tinkering around and uh, house ruling this, that, and the other until it became something he wanted to produce as a second edition of the game. And the second edition draws inspiration from a lot of places but it is it is its own game uh, there are some um, nods to white box nods to fifth edition D, &D um, nods to the one ring there are you can clearly see where he drew inspiration and then where he you know created his own stuff and put it in the game and um, the too long didn't watch version is this is fantastic i really really enjoyed it and i look forward to running it at some point in the future however if you're going to hang around for the video we are going to look at it in depth so some of these could get a bit lengthy um, but i'm going to try to focus on one or two books at a time the main book we are focusing on uh, today is the core book uh, the hero's journey second edition and uh, I think you're going to enjoy it. If you like Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit, uh, folklore, fairy tales, that's the kind of feel that this game is going for. And yes, I know it's a fantasy game, but, and, and I've even done videos on how many more fantasy games do we really need out there. Well, need is eh, objective, to say the least. So we don't really need any other fantasy games, and he even talks about that in his book. But this is a different type of fantasy, uh, whereas White Box lends itself a lot more to sword and sorcery type uh, fantasy. Like I said, this is more like your folklore, fairy tale, <clears throat> uh, Chronicles of Narnia, Lord of the Rings type fantasy. And if you enjoy that kind of stuff, I think you'll really enjoy this. So without any further ado, I suggest we take a look at the book. So here we are with The Hero's Journey, Fantasy Role Playing 2nd Edition. Fantastic, beautiful cover art. There's the front. From the back of the book, every hero must undergo a journey. Welcome to the second edition of The Hero's Journey, completely remastered with an all-new rule set re-engineered to focus on exciting, heroic storytelling. The Hero's Journey second edition is a toolkit book designed to give you all the options you need to tell classic fantasy stories. New archetypes, lineages, and a brand new magic system combined to present an experience that feels uniquely drawn from the childhood stories you used to read and share with your friends uh, by Barrel Rider Games and Galliant Night Games. Alright, let's take a look at the book. For our opening page, our introduction, which talks about uh, <clears throat> James's first edition of the game and how the second edition came about. Uh, nice uh, table of contents here. Rule number one, uh, the narrator always has the right to modify the rules. In fact, it's encouraged. A section on dice and 
you know, uh, how they're abbreviated. Most of this is familiar to all of us as gamers. Uh, let's see, then we have attributes. Now the attributes have been changed a bit, some of which is just really changed in name, um, but others uh, have been changed completely. So you have might, which is essentially your strength. And it gives, you know, warriors get a plus five bonus to experience if they have a might of 15 or higher. Uh, characters might modifiers added to attack rolls made with melee weapons. Uh, their might modifiers added to damage roll made with melee weapons. So this is clearly just strength. And then you have finesse, which is a combination of physical coordination and quick reflexes. So it's your, that's your dex. You have resolve, which is a combination of your mental and physical fortitude. Um, so this is... Your but it's it's also your psychological uh, discipline. This is your kind of your will, and then you have insight, which represents your awareness, reasoning, solving puzzle abilities. So this is kind of your intelligence. You have bearing for your character, which represents your natural charm, uh, personal magnetism, leadership capabilities, so on and so forth. And you have Wheel. Now, I would like to point out this art that is fantastic throughout all of these books. This is actually the uh, author's game group drawn out here, playing the game, and their characters in-game above it, which is just phenomenal. But you also have Wheel. Wheel is some heroes are marked by fate, for better or worse, whether touched by a great destiny or terrible doom, Fate has an impact on their lives. This is reflected in their wheel attribute. Wheel is important for yeomen. Yeomen receive plus five bonus to experience uh, if they have uh, a wheel of 15 or higher. What wheel does though is during a single session of play, a character can choose to have advantage on a number of rolls equal to their wheel modifier. Uh, characters with a wheel of six or less risk having the narrator impose disadvantage on a number of rolls equal to their wheel modifier, which is usually a penalty. Uh, the player must declare advantage before the roll. Likewise, the narrator must declare disadvantage before the player makes the roll. So your universal attribute bonus chart. In this game, if you have a three, it's a negative two to your, uh, that's your penalty to your attribute. If you have a 4 to 6, it's below average, that's a negative 1. 7 to 14 is your average, so nothing. 15 to 17 is a plus 1, it's above average. And then exceptional is 18, which is a plus 2. Uh, then it talks about your experience bonus you get for having a above average uh, attribute related to your profession, your, your uh archetype, excuse me, profession is separate. And it has a little subsection here about attributes above 18 because they generally don't go that high. And a lot of these are like optional rules and these little blocks like this. So the next thing we look at is you have profession, which is very similar to how backgrounds work in like fifth edition D and D you, uh, you can either pick or you can roll randomly on the chart for what your profession was before you somehow got wrapped up in the adventure that's going on because no one was born an adventurer and before your character took up the path of heroism they likely had a mundane profession or trade and basically each one is described and it tells you how many gold pieces or starting gear that you get with it and then there's a chart on the next page where you can randomly roll by race or lineage which is what races are in this game, to determine what you are. But you have an armorer, a bower, cartographer, cook, farmer, fisherman, forester, gambler, groom, haunt, hunter, not haunt, jeweler, miner, navigator, sailor, scribe, stonemason, tailor, tanner, teamster, trapper, uh, you could just be unskilled, you could be a urchin, a weaponsmith, woodworker, or you could be nobility. <clears throat> so we look at the chapter two, which is creating a character. And in creating a character, the first step is we're going to pick the lineage, which is your race, essentially. 
Now, you don't just roll down the, the, the line for your stats in this game, for your attributes. Each race has uh, a set dice pool for each attribute, depending on the race. So the first race that we see is the Changeling. And you'll see that for Might, they get 3d6. For Finesse, they get 2d6 plus 6. Resolve is 3d6. Insight is 3d6. Bearing is 2d6 plus 1. And their wheel is 3d6. So each race is going to be a little bit different as far as how they their dice pool works. And then table 2, 2 is the, uh, the archetype's level limit. So when the lineage, which is the race, picks an archetype, which is kind of your class, you uh, look over here to see how high of a level you can go in that. Now keep in mind this is not set in stone. This is how it's designed to be played, but um, James has gone into great deal to express the fact that this is your game. If you want to play these higher than those levels, then go for it. So each race is going to have a description of the race, a attribute pool, uh, dice pool chart, a level limit chart, and then they're going to have the abilities of the race listed here. And I'm not going to read through all of them because this, uh, this video would get to be like three hours long. But you have a changeling, dwarf, elf, half-elf, halfling, human, and then this one I found to be really neat uh, and something that I don't see in a lot of games is, and this is a uh, variant, which is an optional rule, and you need to get your narrator's permission to play something like this, but it's the errant human. In many fairy tales and classic fantasy stories, the hero or heroes are often humans from our mundane world that have somehow been transported to the fantastic world they previously believed only existed in the realms of fiction. In these new strange lands, they have been called on to be a hero that the world needs, if it is to survive the rising darkness. Whether they have taken up this role willingly or they are simply fulfilling their duty until they can find a way home, a strange landscape of danger and excitement is now before them and they must forge their own destiny. Known as errants, they function almost identically to humans with the following exceptions. They, are, they have the ability hero from a distant land. Because they are not native to the fantastic world, they do not begin play with combat training human lineage abilities, uh, and their profession is always unskilled. Destined for greatness, a, a character creation, a player may select one attribute and roll 2d6 plus 6 for that attribute instead of the 3d6. And then this is a really neat add-on ability here. Genre savvy. Errants are now well, <clears throat> are often well versed in what is in their world fiction and fantasy. Once per session of play, they may ask the narrator if their knowledge of fantastic literature offers insight into a particular location, creature, spell, or magic item. If the character then succeeds on an insight-based attribute saving throw, they receive a clue or hint gleaned from their previous reading about the thing in question. So that's kind of neat if you wanted to play a game where people got transported from our world to the fantasy world, <clears throat> like uh, Chronicles of Narnia, uh, or just to name one. Uh, one of the first fantasy novels I ever read was a, an entire gaming group that got transferred to... Uh, a fantasy world. In fact, there was a whole series of those books. But chapter three brings us to archetypes, and archetypes are kind of, your, they're your classes, basically. All right, so what classes do we have? We have the Bard, and each class will have, you know, levels one through ten, the XP needed to gain the level, endurance, which is your hit points, um, uh, your attack bonus, your saving throw, and like the Bard has lore, uh, this works like the thievery ability in White Box, where if you want to use the lore or thievery or whatever it is, the, uh, the the narrator will roll behind the screen a D6, and if he rolls your level or lower, then it succeeds. Um, and obviously this goes up, so up to a 5. And then Apprentice Spells per day, and I'll explain what that is when we get to looking a little more into magic. 
But, you know, it has the description, it has the armor and weapon restrictions, and the, how their spell casting works, any abilities you get from being a bard. Then we have our burglar, Mr. Baggins. Uh, let's see. We have our knights, rangers, swordsmen, warriors, Wizards and Yeoman, and let's let, we'll, uh, let's see. I think that's the last one in there. More great art, yes, yeah. Then we go into equipment. One thing I want to point out is like with the uh, wizard. I was looking at this earlier. You'll notice you don't have like a a, uh, a cleric class, and that's okay. Uh, because your wizard can cast a spell at first level that does heal endurance. But if you're playing this in the fairy tale style setting, you're going to find that it doesn't do a lot of... There, there's not like shops where you're buying magic potions and things like that. Magic items are very rare and very special in this game. Uh, but like your, your spell casting... Uh, let's see... You can, like with your wizard, they can cast levels of spells listed on their chart. Uh, it does spell out in here that you can cast a lower level spell in a higher slot, but you don't necessarily have to memorize them in the mornings. You just, you have two first level slots, then you can cast two of the first level spells. Let's see, what else do we have? We are going into equipment. Equipment and weight is handled really cool in here. I really like the adventuring gear tables. I'm probably going to port this over. Uh, so even when I'm not playing this game, I'll probably use a lot of this for my regular white box because it's a pretty extensive table of gear and everything is well described. Uh, sometimes it's a little irritating when you get to gear and they don't have stuff described. Let's see, we have transportation listed in here with descriptions, uh, weapons and armor, and I will, you will note that on the damage, not every, this is not like white box where everything does a D6 or 2D6 or whatever. You have varying damage. Uh, a battle axe does a D10 damage, whereas a hand axe does a D6, so on and so forth. It gives you your weight and cost and so on and so forth. Ranged weapons, same deal. The art in this book is just amazing. I, I swear I love it. Now here's where things get interesting. I really like this concept on armor. Uh, I've always hated the D&D concept of, well, I have bigger, heavier armor, so I'm harder to hit. That really doesn't make sense. It slows you down. It makes you bulkier. You should not be harder to hit because you have bigger, heavier armor on you should be harder to damage. And that's what armor does in this game. <clears throat> in this game, the armor that you wear has a reduction value. And depending on how you know big and heavy the armor is, that value can range from one to five. And what happens is when you get hit in combat or from a spell and you take damage, that reduction value is taken off the damage and then any remaining damage comes directly to you. It's also worth pointing out here that even if the reduction would take the damage you were taking to zero, if you were hit, you still take at least a single point of damage. But I like that better. Armor protecting you from taking damage more than just stopping you from getting hit. Now shields, shields and dex bonuses work to protect you from getting hit. Uh, they deflect blows or help you dodge out of the way, <clears throat> so they go directly to your defense bonus. And shields, depending on whether it's a buckler, a small shield, large shield, it ranges in a defense bonus of plus two to plus eight. So uh, I really like the way that works on armor. We have a section on hiring assistants and uh, hirelings. The difference being, if you don't know, assistants are people that you kind of hire in town or whatever that 
do things for you. They don't go on adventures with you, but they work for you to produce something. And uh, there's a cost per week that you have to pay them. And sometimes what you're paying them to do takes more than a week. But you can hire an alchemist, an animal trainer, an assassin, craftsman, blacksmith, engineer, a groom, a laborer, sage, sailor, sea captain, or a spy. And then it goes into explanation on what each one is. Hirelings, on the other hand, you can hire to go with you, cost per week and their loyalty rating. You can hire archers, cavalry, man-at-arms, or servants. Servants can be everything from torchbearers to uh, laborers who are willing to brave dangers of dark places of the world and help you carry treasure out. And then we get to chapter five, playing the game. Uh, there are house rules, again, that are included in these uh, little blurbs here on the treasure keeper and the initiative tracker, which are jobs that you can give to or can be taken up by players at the table. And if they do, they earn a little extra experience for it. So that's kind of cool. Uh, it talks about gaining experience. This is not just slay the monsters, gain the gold, and you get experience. Um, you actually... <clears throat> It'll take you a really long time to level up, and you'll probably die a lot in the process if you try that in this game. You do gain XP from defeating monsters, and keep in mind I said defeating, not necessarily killing. There are a lot of times, most of the time, some way around the monster, and if you can f figure that out, you could still get the XP for it. You also could get... Uh, each of these is listed. These are XP rewards that you can get once per session. And uh, playing your character's lineage or arch archetype is worth 100 XP. Uh, attempt to a potentially life-threatening act of heroism is worth 250. Defeating a foe, group of foes that is a genuine danger to yourself or your friends or goodly folk, that's worth 250. A uh, player character performs a surprising or clever deed that helps the party or other allies. That's worth 150. Uh, the player encourages other players to get involved, role play, and contribute to the game. That's worth 100. Making everyone at the table laugh out loud. That's worth 75. And then if somebody is doing the optional treasure keeper or initiative tracker, they can earn 50 apiece for that. Uh, let's see, we have a section that talks about time and movement. Uh, how it works per race, uh, excuse me, lineage. We also have, instead of a lot of modifiers, you have very little in the way of modifiers and uh, it uses advantage, disadvantage. So if you played 5th edition D&D, you should be familiar with this, where if you have advantage, you roll 2d20 and uh, you pick the higher of the two. Disadvantage, you roll 2d20 and pick the lower of the two. Um, combat... Initiative and Surprise is a little different than some games. In this, everybody rolls a d12 and adds their appropriate modifiers to the roll. And the narrator rolls a d12 for each grouping of monsters. Now, before combat starts, the players can basically trade their initiatives around, but the narrator can trade around the initiatives between his groups of monsters, his or her groups of monsters as well. Um, however, anybody who rolls a 1, 2, or a 3 on their initiative cannot trade as they are surprised. Uh, it goes over actions, you know, attacking, and it's pretty standard stuff. You roll a d20, add your bonuses, you're trying to beat a defense modifier, or defense. Um, it has house rules for critical hits, heroic damage, talks about other actions like casting a spell, running movement. Your defense, which starts at 10 and goes up with your dex bonus, I'm sorry, your finesse bonus, and your uh, shield if you have one as well. Uh, again, talks about your reduction value, damage and death, and you don't just hit zero and die in this game. Uh, if the character suffers enough damage to drive their endurance to a negative value, they immediately have to make a saving throw or they suffer a grievous wound. Uh, they suffer a penalty that saving throw equal to the current negative value of their endurance. 
If it is successful, they are knocked unconscious and cannot act until they are healed to one endurance. This healing can be through magical or mundane uh, purposes. That's if you get knocked below automatically. But when a character reaches zero endurance, they simply fall unconscious and suffer uh, the effects of a grazing blow, <clears throat> which is described here. So, you, if they just if you just get hit here, if you get if you get knocked below your endurance, you have to roll on the grievous wounds chart, which means you might die on a one or lower. Uh, despair is a really neat thing that's been added in here, as not only creatures but places can have a despair rating. Now, what does a despair rating do? Okay, so uh, characters can suffer. Despair under the following circumstances, though the narrator is free to bring the effects of despair into other circumstances. When one of the situations described below has happened, a player characters are required to make a saving throw. If the saving throw fails, the character has become overwhelmed with despair and suffers disadvantage on all attack rolls and saving throws until the source of the despair has been resolved and is no longer present. So if you're fighting a monster that has a despair rating, then it, you have to make a saving throw or you're using you're having to go disadvantage when attacking this thing or making saves against it but also if you're traveling through like blighted lands a uh, great example of this would be sam and frodo you know going through those nasty marshes and stuff trying to sneak into mordor through the back door that would be a great uh <clears throat> example in my opinion of uh, blighted lands and despair affecting the heroes. Uh, let's see, we have binding wounds, which is very similar to mending wounds in white box, except that you regain 1d4 endurance instead of 1d6. Uh, it has a section on invisible opponents, negotiation and diplomacy, saving throws, poisons. A uh, very nice example of combat. I like it when they put this kind of stuff in here. It's always fun to read and Sometimes you read the example and you get something you didn't get before. Uh, it talks about renown. The more <clears throat> your players go out and do stuff and the higher level they get, the more renown they can get. Torches, lanterns, and light sources, how they work, how far you can see. And uh, a pretty decent in-depth look at wilderness explore exploration and hex crawling. Uh, let's see. It has an exploration chart in here. And then, like if you're hex crawling, uh, you can roll and check each of these. You got dense forest, desert, grasslands, mountains, swamps, tundra. Uh, and then it talks about the difference between blessed and blighted lands. Uh, swimming and drowning, falling rules, making camp. All too often, making camp in games is just, yeah, we make camp and go to sleep. We set a watch, whatever. This actually gives you things to do while you're making camp that are beneficial to your party like dealing with provisions, sleep and rest, keeping watch, uh, relaxing around the campfire and in future supplements there's more stuff added that you can do with making camp. The next section that we're going to get into is chapter 6 spells and magic. Spells and magic works a bit differently in this than what you're used to in other uh, fantasy role-playing games and I like it it's very very cool very thematic and it's very different than uh, the normal Vancean style magic so we start looking at the spell list the spells are broken into three categories your apprentice level spells journeyman spells and master spells obviously the higher they go the more powerful the spell <clears throat> But think of these as your low-level, mid-level, high-level spells. Now, the way spells work in here, instead of having magic missile and, you know, charm person, so on and so forth, what you have is if you can cast an apprentice-level spell, you pick one that you know, and you cast it just like normal. You spend an action to cast it. But these spells haven't just been renamed. They do different things. So, for instance, you have Breathe in Silver, which is your first apprentice level spell. You look at the spell descriptions, it tells you kind of a description of the spell, and then it has three different, completely different effects. 
When you cast the spell, you choose one of these three effects that you want to happen. And then it's the same for every spell. You have the description of the spell, the level or block of the spell, you know, is it apprentice, journeyman, or master? And then you have three options for how the spell will take effect. That is just fantastic. It's very, very simple, but it makes the magic very diverse. And it allows you to play around with it and do different really cool things. So I'm not going to go over each one of them because this video is already pretty long. So I'm just going to skip past that, um, get the book and read it. It's great. So we have chapter seven, which is running the game. And it talks about being a narrator. This section on themes, uh, again, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it talks about the theme of the game, kind of giving you the implied world. Uh, it talks about the themes you should set up, like exploration of the unknown, the fading realm, which I thought that was very cool. Uh, heroic characters, danger, wonder. Absolutely. You should read this if you want to run this kind of game, regardless of whether you're using this game system to do it or not. This entire section is one of the best game master sections I've seen in any uh, non D and D fantasy. Well, hell, it's better than D and D to be honest with you. But it's it's a really good section. I really liked it. We have a section on bringing the heroes together. Uh, a section on de uh, designing adventures, developing legendariums, which is your campaigns, how to challenge the players. And then we reach the menagerie, which is our bestiary, our bestiary. And you have tons of different monsters. Uh, each one has its defense, attack modifier, any special abilities it has, its speed, its endurance, which is again is its hit points, attacks that it causes and damage, what its saving throw is, if it has a built-in reduction value, and if it has a despair rating. Which, you know, if you meet something with a despair rating higher than you, then you should probably run. But there's so many great ones in here. They're very, like, they're fantasy, but a lot of this is very, like I said, folklore, fairy tale. You have black flyers, giant bats, griffins, harpies, uh, high hawks, manticores, ravens, uh, sturges. You even have common folk in here. Guards, nobles, peasants, robbers. We have different kinds of demons, imps, Lord of Flame and Shadow, you shall not pass. Succubus, I can't even pronounce that one. Usurer, Usurer. I don't know. I, I probably butchered that. That's fine. Basilisk, uh, Cockatrice, Elder Worms. That thing has a despair rating of 15. Just run away. Look at that art, though. Man, that's cool. All right, we have the Lindworm. Wyvern, Drowning Spout, your Dryad, Kobold, Nymph, Salamander, Centaurs, Hippogriffs, Horses, Nightsteeds, Unicorns, uh, different kinds of Fae. You have Brownies, uh, Fairy Dragons, Fetch, Fae Cat, Fae Consort, the Fae Queen, Hag, a Puck, a Red Cap, Satyr, uh, we have goblin, or I'm sorry, not goblin, giant kin, like the fire blog, uh, fire giant, frost giant, ogres, sky giants, stone giants, trolls, goblin, goblin kings, goblin merchants, uh, different types of insects and parasites like the fire beetle, giant leech, giant rats, giant spiders. Look at that. That's a giant spider for you right there. Good lord. Spider Queen, Werebears, uh, Were Rats, Werewolves, Animated Weapons, Gargoyles, Sea Serpents, Serpent Men, Bears, Goats, Insect Swarms, Rats, Stags, Black Dogs, uh, Frost Fangs, Hellhounds, Wargs, Wolves, Undead, we have Banshees, Death Knights, uh, Skeletons, yeah, even your basic skeleton has a despair rating of two. Yeah. Uh, specters, vampires, whites, and zombies. 
Wow, zombies have a despair rating of three. They should be scary. Uh, we have a section on wandering monsters here. And then we have treasure and magical items. And treasure being your riches, your gold, things like that, it gives a very good explanation for how you should work out how much treasure a, a creature should have, which I thought was pretty neat in the way it was done. But then you have the, uh, you know, magical items and you don't find a whole bunch of just you know that's your standard plus one sword it's your standard plus one dagger most of the magical items have become magical because they've been tied to some creature or person for x amount of time who's done great and heroic or terrible things and this has kind of imbued a legacy upon these items as time has gone on and you can it, you can actually create your own uh, heirlooms that have their own abilities and stuff based on your lineage. Um, it's just really cool the way magic items are handled in here. They are very special. There's nobody just pumping out you know six packs of healing potions. Uh, but it does go into the heirlooms and how you handle those <clears throat> uh, changeling heirlooms. You know, like the Book of Nightmares, Fairy Dust. You've got Dwarven Heirlooms, uh, let's see, Elven Heirlooms, Half Elf, which can use either Elf or Human, uh, Halfling Heirlooms, Human Heirlooms, and then we hit an Appendix, which gives us, um, you know, suggested reading, films, role-playing games. Uh, another fantastic piece of art. Looks like the group is breaking up from the night here and their party is breaking up here in the game world, which is kind of cool. And then we have our character sheet, which you can also download, I believe, for free. And then the game license stuff. So the only down, the only downside I really have to this is I wish it had an index. I, I really like it when they put an index in the book. It's faster than a table of contents most of the time. However, most of this is not hard to find in the book either. I have to admit that. I'm going to throw a little bonus in here, and that is one of the other books I got for this is The Hero's Grimoire. This is, I think, 32 pages, and this is a fantastic little book. It's Like I said, it's really cheap. You can, you can get the PDF or the print copy of it. And what this does is it literally just has the rules for spells in the beginning of it. It tells you how to use the book. And then it has the spell list. And every spell from here is in this along with six new spells. And keep in mind, each of those spells also has three different varying ways that they can work. Uh, so it, it's a, actually quite a bit. But that's all that's in this. And that's fantastic because if I'm running the game, sometimes I've got two or three things bookmarked in here. I don't want to have to dig through to look up a spell to see how it works. It's nice to have just the spells at my fingertips. But it's also nice if you're a player and you're playing a caster to physically have your grimoire in your hands and there's nothing in here but the spells. And they added new spells to it. So that's really, really cool. Not enough info here to do a whole video on just this book, but I thought it warranted adding on to this because I think if you're going to play, these are the two books that you hands down must get your hands on. So, uh, we're going to go back to the other camera for a minute. Hope you enjoyed that. So I hope you enjoyed that look at The Hero's Journey 2nd Edition. I think it's fantastic. I love that it's different than the regular sword and sorcery type stuff that's out there. I also hope you enjoyed the bonus look at the Hero's Grimoire. Uh, they're really, really good books. Yes, it is well known that I am a fan of James Spawn. Um, I'm also friends with him. We talk quite a bit. That did not influence my opinion on the game. Um, I only really had one negative aspect of the game, and that's just that I wish it had an index. But again, uh, there are several games I've bought that don't have indexes, so it's not like that's a deal breaker for me. However, if you enjoyed this type of uh, game, the way it's described here, and you're looking for something like that, 
you can, I believe, get it on Amazon. Uh, I know you can get it drive through RPG because that's where I got these. Uh, all five books are available on there. I don't know about Amazon. I think just the main book last time I looked. But they are really, really well done. Like, a, like you saw, the art is fantastic. The books are laid out really well. The game is written very, very well. Um, I'm very impressed. I really, really enjoyed it. And like I said, I do look forward to being able to run this. It will probably be sometime after the holidays because between the games I've already got going and the holidays themselves, I'm just wrapped up until after all of that's over with. But we will be taking a look at some of the other books coming up in this series. I hope you've enjoyed this. If you did, please remember to like, share, subscribe. Um, check out the Amazon wish list in the description. Uh, if there's something on there that you want to see me review or take a look at the book at, you can purchase it. Amazon will send it to me. And that's more video content for you to enjoy. Helps me help you. Uh, we also have the Redbubble store, which we're working to get some more uh, shirts and stuff up now. Um, I, I think there's a new one that may be ready in about a week to go up. Um, there's also, if you'd like to see more behind the scenes type stuff or communicate with me outside of just the comment section, you can find me at Rob's Game Group on Facebook. Uh, the link for that is in the description. And that's our page on Facebook. Uh, come join us over there. And until next time, my friends, good gaming and good luck.